my life. <laughs> my life is being made to look like a freak, right, when it's not my fault, okay? This is what happened to me the other day. I'm on the phone to my mum, my lovely, beloved, saintly mother, okay? And I need to go for a slash. So I do the right thing. I'm like, Mum, I'm really sorry. I've got to go. I will call you back later, all right? I pressed hang up. Everyone see that? I've pressed hang up, all right? I go into the toilet, right? I unzip. I start having a slash. All of a sudden, I hear my mum's voice. I look down. I realise, apparently, I hadn't pressed hang up. I had switched it to FaceTime. <laughs> She was just like, make sure you wash your hands. I was like, ah! <laughs> Looks just like your father. Shut up, my <laughs> And basically, in my life, all I've ever wanted to do is make my parents proud, and especially my mum, right? Because my mum, she's very proud of her children, but she's also very openly proud about her children. She loves doing that thing that all mums like doing, right? Going to do the weekly shop at the local supermarket, and then when she's there doing the weekly shop, just look around for other local mothers in the area. And then they go over, they start to have a little bit of a chat, a little bit of banter about whatever, silly nonsense. And then slowly but surely, that banter will segue into a little exchange where they start showing off about their children. Back and forth, back and forth. And what it becomes is essentially, in the supermarket, a little supermarket game of top trumps with your kids. <laughs> and my mum is amazing at playing child top trumps, because when she plays against other mothers, my mum thinks outside the box. She uses categories that you didn't even know existed. And she can win any exchange with any mother, even when she's showing off about my little brother Barnaby, who by far and away is her dud card. <laughs> yes. You know the way every set of siblings has to have the one that shit. If you're sat there thinking, ours doesn't, it's you. <laughs> But I've seen my mum do it right. She'll scour around Sainsbury's looking for the mother that she wants to have the exchange with, hunting down her prey. And then, when she finds the mother, she'll ram the trolley in front of her and my mum will start the game. Oh, hello, Jane. How's Joe? Yes, Joe's doing very well, Hilary. He has bought a new house. He's moving into it with his girlfriend and he's got a new job. He's earning quite a lot of money. How's your son? I forget his name. Oh, yes. Barnaby. Yeah, Barnaby's fine. <laughs> How big are Joe's feet? I beg your pardon. You heard me, bitch. Um... <laughs> Well, I think he's only a size eight. Ooh, only size eight. Well, Barnaby is size 13. Ooh, did my mum just hit you with the my son's got a bigger dick card? <laughs> I think she did. It's a low blow, but she'll take the round. Walk on, bitch. Mothers were terrified of my mum. They would cower, try and avoid eye contact with her. My mother was very much the sheriff in that town. But then, ladies and gentlemen, approximately five months ago, someone else started shopping in our local Sainsbury's. Someone that had come into a little bit of money recently. And all of a sudden, there was a new sheriff in town. And that sheriff's name was a Mrs. Claire Pattinson. <laughs> His mum started shopping in our supermarket. And that woman was unbeatable at child top trumps. My mum wouldn't know what to do. She'd desperately try and hide. But Claire would always catch up with her. She'd ram the trolley in front of my mum and this time she'd start the exchange. How's Jack? Yes, Jack's doing fine. How's Robert? Robert's doing very well. How big are Robert's feet? Robert's feet? Well, I think he's only a very small size seven. <gasps> only size seven? Well, well, Jack is size, well, obviously that's size seven in the UK, Hillary. He doesn't live here anymore. He lives in Los Angeles, where I think he's a size 44. But he doesn't have to buy shoes for himself because the studio buy them for him because he's earning them so much money in films like Twilight, which grows $295 million in its opening weekend. What's Jack doing this weekend? Oh, a gig in Sunderland. How quaint. <laughs> ruining my life. He's affecting my diet. And it's all right for Claire Pattinson just waltzing down the aisles of Sainsbury's, buying herself only the finest organic range, couscous and quails. Meanwhile, my mother is self-harming in Lidl. <laughs> Everyone's on Twitter now. My, my, my mum is on Twitter. That's something that happened recently. My mum joined Twitter. Oh my God, that was awful. Because as soon as my mum got it as well, my dad was like, well, if Hillary is having the twat book, then I should be on it as well. <laughs> So now they're both on it, and they both twat at each other. <laughs> and I can't get this thing into their heads, this concept, right, of the public domain. Has anyone had to try and explain that to their parents? It's the, you sit them down, like, basically, Mum, what the public domain means, right, is that my friends can read the 
get you right. So be very careful. Doesn't go into her brain. Do you know what she tweeted the other day? At my dad, in the public domain. <laughs> At Michael Whitehall, in need of a tea bag. <laughs> no! No! Why? All my friends retweeting it, favouriting it. Do you know what they tried to get trending? Hashtag 50 Shades of Earl Grey. <laughs> so my grown up living was going very well. It was going very well, my grown up living in my flat with my coasters and everything. But then it took a little bit of a nosedive because I realised there was one thing I no longer had which I really relied on, and that was my mother. Okay. <laughs> Because I will be the first to admit, Hammersmith, I'm a massive mummy's boy, okay? My mum is incredible. She does everything for me. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for my mum. <laughs> That's a fact. That's a fact. <laughs> no, but when I first started doing, you know, stand-up and stuff, I was too young to drive, for example. So my mum used to drive me to all of my gigs. She'd drive me there, I'd do the show, and then she'd wait outside in the car, and then she'd take me back afterwards. So, I know, rock and roll. The, uh... <laughs> It meant it was quite hard to pick up ladies after shows. <laughs> yeah, you want to come back to my crib, baby? Yeah, my ride's outside. It's the Volvo estate. You'll have to sit in the back, because me and mother like to ride up front and listen to Radio 4. <laughs> not many people came back with me. <laughs> I'm not letting my mum off the hook here as well, by the way. My mum is also mad. My mum is a dog mummy. My mum is a dog mummy. She was my mummy, and then I left home, and I'm now dead to her. And her only child is her dog, Philomena. Yes, some fans of Philomena in this evening. Uh, it's got to the point, though, now where it is obsession. It is obsession with Philomena. My old room at my house has been cleaned out and it has been turned into a shrine to Philomena. There's pictures of Philomena, there's paintings of Philomena, there's models of Philomena, there's passive aggressive embroidery on scatter cushions. <laughs> Dotted round the room, when I needed a hand, I found a paw. <laughs> At Christmas, my mum just, just goes to town with the presents. And it is not just the presents that she buys for her dog. She also purchases presents for herself that she then wraps up and pretends that the dog has given her. <laughs> Don't encourage this behaviour! We have to sit there on Christmas Day as she unwraps these presents that she's bought for herself and wrapped up for herself and pretended that she's been given by the dog and sit there and pretend that this is the behaviour of a rational human being <laughs> and not someone that needs psychiatric help. Oh, I wonder what Philomena's bought mummy! <laughs> Hopefully a <laughs> straitjacket! <laughs> Then we have to sit through the next bit. The next bit is the presents that she has bought for Philomena. I mean, my presents now are a joke. All I get is passive-aggressive presents from my mother, things like deodorant, <laughs> a baby grow last year. It's like, I don't have a child, don't remind me. <laughs> Philomena just ridiculously spoiled. Philomena got artisan biscuits last Christmas. Yes, artisan biscuits in four different flavours. Sat there as my mum's feeding Philomena this smorgasbord of artisan biscuits. Oh, which flavour did you prefer? Was it the vanilla and cardamom or the vanilla and cinnamon? How refined a palate do you think Philomena has, mummy? <laughs> she didn't seem that fussy just now when I took her on a walk and she was licking another dog's asshole. <laughs> to him, Philly. Oh, God, and now the dog is licking your mouth. <laughs> what is that about? My mother, who is so much of a germaphobe, she will take a wet wipe to an ATM machine before using it, yet now appears to be happy to go <laughs> to mouth with the neighbor's shih tzu. <laughs> now, I got, I got picked on to school. And I used to come home to my mum, right? And I would ask her for advice. I remember it. I would come home and I'd say, Mum, these guys are picking on me. What should I do? I was helpless, I was vulnerable, all right? I was lost. And do you know what my mum said to me? This was her genuine advice. She said, Jack, what you need to do is you need to stand up to these vicious, nasty pieces of work in the playground, and you need to say to them, very loud and very proud, from the very depths of your soul, sticks and stones <laughs> may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Are you f high? <laughs> yeah, as we all know, the one Achilles 
ladies here at All Bullies have is a little bit of rhyming verse. They hear some poetry and their powers just melt away. This is not even a good rhyme. Sticks and stones may break my bones. Don't give this to the suggested arsenal of weapons with which to inflict pain upon me with. But my mum did. She tried to stop me from having sex when I was living at home. And it wasn't that she didn't, she didn't mind me having sex elsewhere. That wasn't a problem. Like, uh, I remember I went away on my first ever sort of stag weekend with some friends to this horny, hooker-ridden pimple in Eastern Europe called Tallinn. My mum helped me pack my bag. In the front pocket, my mum put 30 condoms. <laughs> 30. I was there for two days. <laughs> I counted them when I came back. There was 31. <laughs> But it was sex in her house that she wasn't happy with. And she had all these different ways, a whole arsenal of ways of stopping me from having sex in her house. Now, the first thing she did was to try and desexualize my bedroom. And she thinks I didn't notice. It was so obvious. The longer I'd be going out with a girl, the more children's toys would suddenly appear littered on the floor. Family photographs adorning every single mantelpiece. A massive framed picture of my creepy uncle above the bed. And this huge mound of cushions as well, towered high over the bedspread. You'd have to hack through before you could even get into the sheets. And they all had little things embroidered on them as well to kill any kind of sexual mood. You know, home sweet home, mummy knows best, daddy's under the bed. <laughs> and it didn't stop there. It didn't stop there, no. The other one she did, right, is as soon as I turned 18, she bought me a new bed. I was like, oh, thanks, mum, a new bed. The loudest bed I've ever had sex on <laughs> in my entire life. This thing would creak in space. <laughs> And it's not like I was having loud sex on it as well. I was trying to have the quiet... I don't know why I'm looking at you there, Darren. That's so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was trying to have the quiet sex that I could possibly... I was very conscious that my mum was beneath me. Not beneath. No, no. <laughs> I mean the room below, you sick fucks. <laughs> no, it's stealth sex. So that's what I used to call it. Like, proper stealth sex. The quieter... Me and my girlfriend at the time, we'd be having sex so quietly, we were doing it like... Like we were Anne Frank's parents. It was that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she didn't put that in the diary. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of stuff I look back on, and I look at what my mum used to tell me when I was younger, and I think, what was she talking about? Mummisms. You know these mummisms that your mum used to tell you? A watched pot never boils. <laughs> Money doesn't grow on trees, Jack. Any holes a goal? No, 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 that's not one. <laughs> no one's mum told them that. <laughs> well, maybe someone's mum made stew pods. <laughs> the best moment of a childhood, though, is when you can use a mumism against your mum. It happens very rarely, but when it does, oh my God, it is the best moment of a childhood. <laughs> Happened to me once when I was growing up. I was in the car. My mum had stalled it. It was definitely my mother's fault. She was choosing to blame the car. She's in the front with my dad. She's like, Michael, this car is hopeless. We need to sell it. I spoke to my friend Fiona, and Fiona told me that we have to get a Volvo. I leant forward, really smug. I was like, Mother, if Fiona told you to jump off a cliff... <laughs> she smacked me, but it was worth it. <laughs>